in verse 17, Proverbs 17, 17. The Bible says a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. In Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse number 9, the same writer, Solomon, he says in Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion, but woe to the one who falls when there is another, not another to lift him up. Further, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? One of the great themes of the Bible, one of the great themes of the Bible is this theme that's found right there. It's the theme of friendship. It is the theme of companionship. It is the fact that God made us as human beings to be social. He made us to be social creatures. He made us to be involved in other people's lives and to have other people involved in our lives. This is something that I believe we all understand on a very practical level. You know, I'm pretty sure that everybody in this room, I don't care who you are, you have someone or some people in your life that you consider to be your friends. You have some people in your life that you have a very special relationship with. Now, these people may be in your family. They may be in your church family. They may be on your job or in your school or on your sports team or in a dozen of, of other places. None of us, none of us truly lives on an island. None of us live in a, in a vacuum. None of us live life completely isolated from the world and all to ourselves. We all, we all have some people in our lives that we consider to be our friends. The question is, is who are those people? Who are your friends? Who are, who are your best friends? Who are the people who mean more to you than some, than some Facebook list? Who, who are the people in your inner circle? Who are the people that you spend the most time with? Who are the people that you trust? Who are the people that you confide in? What kind of qualities do these people have in their lives? Do they have the right kind of qualities in their lives? Do they have godly qualities? Are they the kind of people who ultimately are making you better for the Lord? I got to tell you that one of my favorite case studies of friendship in the Bible is the case study of David. It is the case study of the man after God's own heart. You see, when it came to this man, after God's own heart, if there's anybody in the Bible who had a lot of friends, it was him. It was David. It was this man who wrote much of the wisdom literature that we're reading this year. You see, when it came to this man who wrote much of the wisdom literature that we're reading this year, we need to understand that he had a lot of wisdom when it came to picking friends. He had a lot of wisdom when it came to picking friends the right kind of people to surround himself with in life. When it came to picking friends in his life, King David, he picked some good friends. He picked some friends who would encourage him and lift him up and support him. And they ultimately epitomized what godly friendship is, is, is really all about. David has some good judgment when it came to picking friends. You take, for example, you take, for example, his friend Jonathan. Jonathan, I firmly believe that one of the greatest examples of friendship we have in the Bible is the friendship that existed between David and Jonathan. I love studying about the friendship that existed between David and Jonathan. You're familiar. You're familiar with the sin that David committed with Bathsheba, right? You're familiar with that. You remember how in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we learn that one of the most critical moments in David's life was when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. She was the wife of one of his mighty men, Uriah the Hittite. 
Remember what started out as David looking at Bathsheba bathing from the roof of his palace that eventually led to him sending for her and laying with her and getting her pregnant and then setting up her husband to be killed in battle in an effort to try to cover up his sin. Remember, at that point in his life, David committed some horrible atrocities, atrocities that would really take his life on a downward spiral. And I've always wondered, I've always wondered to myself, what would have happened to David if Jonathan had been there? What would have happened if Jonathan had not died? By the hands of the Philistines prior to David becoming the king, what would have happened if Jonathan had been right there by David's side to counsel him after he by chance happened to see Bathsheba on that rooftop? What would have happened if Jonathan had been there? I want us to think about that because the Bible describes Jonathan as an amazing man. He's an amazing man. He was a good man, even though he had a wicked father, an evil father. Jonathan was the kind of man that we would all want to be our friend. This is a good man. And so I want you to go in your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 19. I want to read to you several places from the Bible, please. And I want to ask you just to follow along with me. I'm going to read to you several places from the Bible. Please follow with me. We're going to give some commentary about these passages once we're finished with the reading, okay? Let's start with 1 Samuel 19 and verse number 1. In verse 1, it says Saul. This is King Saul, the first king of Israel. He is the father of Jonathan. Now Saul told Jonathan, his son, and all his servants to put David to death. But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, is seeking to put you to death. Now therefore, please be on guard in the morning and stay in a secret place and hide yourself. I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about, about you. If I find out anything, then I will tell you. Then Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Do not let the king sin against his servant David, since he has not sinned against you, and since his deeds have been very beneficial to, to you. For he took his life in his hand. And struck the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by putting David to death without cause? Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul vowed. He promised, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. So notice I saw here, he promises, I'm not going to kill David. He makes a vow to not kill this innocent man. That's the promise he makes. But he's too paranoid and too crazy and too much of a sinful man to keep that promise. This is not a trustworthy man at all. Saul here is promising not to kill David, but you and I both know that he's not going to keep that promise. This is an untrustworthy man, a sinful man. And so in chapter 20, he continues to try to kill David again. And in verse number one, it says, Then David fled from Naoth and Ramah. And came and said to Jonathan, what have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before your father that he's seeking my life? He, Jonathan, said to him, far from it. You shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing either great or small without disclosing it to me. So why should my father hide this thing from me? It's not so. My father's not going to kill you. Verse number three, yet David vowed again, saying, your father knows well. That I have found favor in your sight, and he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, or he will be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, there is hardly a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. Now go to one more place. Look at chapter 23. Chapter 23, verse 15. Saul is continuing to try to kill David. And it says in verse 15, now David became aware that Saul had come out to seek, his, to seek his life while David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David at Horish and encouraged him. He encouraged him in God. Let's take a few moments to really break down 
what's going on there in those verses. Let's start with what we found in chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. Going back to chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, notice how there, in the context, we find David becoming a very popular man among the people of Israel. By that time, he's becoming very popular. By that time, he's being viewed by many of the people as a mighty warrior and a great leader of men. By that time, he's being viewed as a good man, as a noble man, as a man of integrity and great courage. By this time, the people know that David has, has courage unlike anybody else in the land. He has the kind of courage that leads him to be willing to face enemies that I even saw would go out and face enemies like Goliath, enemies like that big, tall Philistine. David, by this time, he is a rising star among the people of Israel. And all of that, all that makes Saul jealous. All that makes him angry. All that makes him like we talked about last Sunday. He is bitter. And he is envious. In fact, he is so bitter and envious towards David that he actually wants to kill David. He actually wants to execute David. He actually wants his son Jonathan to execute David. But Jonathan, Jonathan won't do it. Jonathan won't do this. Even though he loves and respects his father, he is not going to kill David. He is not going to execute David. He is not going to take the life of this good and righteous man. In fact, not only will he not take the life of this good and righteous man, but he also has the courage to stand up to his father and tell him, Daddy, you're wrong. He says, Daddy, you're wrong. He says, Dad, you are committing a sin if you do this. In verse number four, Jonathan tells his father, he says, it is wrong and it is foolish to try to kill David. He says, it is wrong and foolish to try to kill this man who's been nothing but good to us in this kingdom. From that, we see that when it came to Jonathan, Jonathan was the kind of man who stood for righteousness. This was a righteous man. This was the kind of man who always was going to do what was right, even meant stand against his own father. Jonathan was a man who stood for righteousness. He was a good and godly man, but not only was he a righteous, good and godly man, he also was a loyal man. He's loyal to David. Going back to chapter 20, in that context, we see that even though at that time, Jonathan does not agree with David about Saul. He doesn't agree with David as Saul at that time is, is trying to kill him because he hates him. Even though they don't agree about this, Jonathan promises to still be loyal to David. He promises to never stab him in the back or go against him because he knows that David is innocent. In fact, if you go home and you read the rest of that chapter, 1 Samuel 20, you're going to see that not only does Jonathan in that context promise to be loyal to David and never stab him in the back, but he also expresses his great love for David and he begs him not to kill him. He begs him not to have him executed and not to have his family executed once David ascends to the throne. You see, during that time, we need to understand that it was common practice for the coming king or the incoming king to wipe out the previous dynasty. To wipe out the previous king and his whole family. That was common practice during that time. And Jonathan is begging David, please don't do that to me. Please don't kill me. Please don't wipe out my family once you ascend to the throne. You see, from that dialogue that takes place between Jonathan and David, we see that while Saul refused to accept the will of God when it came to David, Jonathan, he did not. Jonathan accepted the will of God. Jonathan accepted the fact that David was God's anointed. He accepted the fact that this man, David, he was going to be the next king. He didn't fight against the will of God. 
He was a loyal friend. But then, in chapter 23, we see that in addition to those things, he was also an encourager. He was also a great encourager when David was once again hiding from Saul. Remember the scripture told us in verse number 16 that Jonathan came out to meet David and he encouraged him in God. He encouraged him in God. I really like that language. I love that language because it shows us what kind of friend Jonathan really was. It shows us that Jonathan was a godly friend. It shows us that Jonathan was the kind of friend who talked with David about God. It shows us that Jonathan was someone who used the wisdom of God to strengthen David during his dark moment in life. He was a righteous man, loyal, and a great encourager. That's the kind of friend that Jonathan was to David. And let me just ask you, do you have friends like that? Do you have Jonathans in your life? Do you have at least one Jonathan in your life? Do you have at least one person who, like Jonathan, will always stand against evil? Do you have at least one friend who always recognizes sin and has no problem calling it out and saying that it's evil and it's wrong? Do you have at least one friend who will always support the will of God? Do you have at least one friend who's always loyal to you? That you can really trust that you have at least one friend who will stick with you during the good days and the dark days. Do you have at least one friend who will encourage you in God? Do you have at least one friend who will talk with you about God? Do you have at least one friend who will make, help you make decisions based on the word of God? Whenever you ha start having problems in your life, whenever you start having all these bad things come upon you in your life, do you have at least one friend who will use the scriptures to encourage you and build you up and help you get through that? Do you have a Jonathan? Do you have a Jonathan in your life? You got a Jonathan in your life? And let me ask you this, are you being a Jonathan in other people's lives? Are you being a Jonathan? Beyond being somebody who may click like on all your friends' Facebook pages, and beyond being someone who likes to do things with your friends that you, that you both have in common, are you someone who, like Jonathan, is loyal? Are you loyal to your friends? Are you standing with your friends during the good times and the bad times? Are you somebody that your friends can really trust? Are you faithful to your friends? Are you being someone that they can trust and not smile in their face and, and laugh with them face to face, but then you go and gossip and, and mock them to other people behind their back? Are you someone that they can trust to stand with them when they're innocent and they're trying to do what's right? Or will you abandon them and sell them out to support corrupt people? Are you someone who when your friends are down and they're displaying a pessimistic spirit, you're the positive person. You're the person who is encouraging them in God. You're the person who is letting them know that God is with you. God loves you. I'm praying with you. I'm praying for you. Better days are coming. Keep your head up. You hang in there. Are you doing that kind of stuff for your friends? That's the kind of stuff Jonathan did. That's the kind of friend that Jonathan was to David. David had a great friend in his life in Jonathan. Jonathan's one of the best friends you're going to read about in all the Bible, but he's not the only friend that David had. Another friend I want to talk with you about that David had is Nathan. I want to talk with you about Nathan. Do you remember who Nathan was? 
Remember, Nathan was a prophet. That's right. He was actually the prophet of God who exposed David's sin with Bathsheba. He was the man who urged David to repent and get his soul right with God. When you go in your Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 12, look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. Now, here in the context of these verses, David has committed this adultery with Bathsheba. He's gotten her pregnant. He has set up her husband Uriah to be killed in battle in an effort to cover up his sin. And some time has elapsed by, by this point. They've actually had their child by this point. That means that maybe a year has gone by. David thinks that he's gotten away with this. He thinks that nobody's going to know about this. He thinks that he's gotten away with this scot-free. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse number 1, the Bible says, And the Lord said, Nathan, the Lord said, Nathan to David. And he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he brought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. He would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come out to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this, he deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan said to David, you. You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, it is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. For us to really be able to appreciate what's going on in those verses, we need to first understand that this was not Nathan's first encounter with David. We need to understand that Nathan wasn't some random prophet who just popped up onto the scene and went before the throne and told David about his sin. No, sir, and no, ma'am. Prior to this moment, David and Nathan were friends. They were well acquainted with each other. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Bible clearly shows us that they had a relationship prior to this moment. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see that David actually consulted with Nathan before planning to build the temple of God. Remember that? Remember David came to Nathan and he says, I want to build a house for God. I want to build God a temple. And initially Nathan told him, hey, that's okay. You go ahead and you do that. You do what's in your heart. But the Lord came to Nathan that night and he said, no, no, no. That's not what I want. I don't want David to build me a temple his son Solomon, a man of peace, he's the one going to build the temple. That's what God told Nathan, and Nathan went back to David, and he told him what the true will of God was. You see, prior to this moment in 2 Samuel 12, Nathan was already counseling David in the ways of God. He was already in David's inner circle when he ascended to the throne, but that didn't mean that what he did here wasn't still dangerous. That didn't mean that what he did here still wasn't very, very risky. You see, by standing up to the king and exposing his sin, his gross sin, in front of maybe all the court of Israel, Nathan could have been fired. Nathan could have been stripped of his position as a prophet to the king. He could have been put in prison. He could have been executed. He could have been killed. There were a lot of risks involved with Nathan confronting David, but his love for God and his love for David helped him overcome those risks. They helped him overcome any fears he may have had in his heart because he, too, was a righteous man. He had to let David know that God knew about his sins and, and there were going to be consequences. He had to let David know the truth 
about this situation. And thankfully, after he came to David and told David this great parable, after he revealed and exposed David's sin, when we continue reading that chapter, we see that, that David took that message to heart. We see that David, thankfully, he, he listened to Nathan. He didn't fire him. He didn't cast him out of Israel. He didn't put him in prison. He didn't have him executed or killed. Instead, David humbly applied the message. He repented of his sin. He turned away from his sin. He humbly accepted the physical consequences for his actions. You see, David's story might have turned out much different if he continued on down that path he was on and then have a friend like Nathan in his life. Nathan was a great blessing to David at this point. The question is, do you have somebody like that? You got a Nathan. You got a Nathan in your life. You got somebody in your life who will support you when you are doing right and they won't support you when you're doing wrong. Whenever you do wrong, they're not going to turn the other way. They're not going to turn on a blind eye. They're not going to make you think that your behavior is okay. Instead, they're going to do for you what Paul talks about in Ephesians 4 and verse 15, and that is they're going to speak to you the truth in love. They're going to try to help you. They're going to look you right in the eye and say, you are the man. Or you are the woman. They're going to love you enough to help get you back on the right spiritual path when they see you wandering off of it. They're going to love you enough to tell you the truth. Even if it means you're going to get mad at them. Or chew them out or defriend them on social media or even stop being their friend altogether. Do you have, do you have? A Nathan to help you spiritually right now in your life. And if you do have a Nathan in your life, let me ask you this. How are you treating your Nathan? How are you treating your Nathan? How are you treating your Nathan when they question you about some bad behavior in your life? How are you treating your Nathan when they question you about the source of your uncontrolled anger and your rudeness and your disrespect towards other people? How are you treating your Nathan when they're confronting you for sinful and ungodly things that you may be promoting on, on social media? How are you treating your Nathan when they come to you and, and question you about why, why you're lukewarm when it comes to faithfully attending the worship assemblies of God? How are you treating your Nathans when they come to you and ask you why you're not growing in your faith? Why you're not growing in your zeal for the Lord as you should? Are you being arrogant and, and angry towards your Nathans? Are you being bitter towards your Nathan? Are you being full of pride towards your Nathan? Or are you being the kind of person who says to your Nathan, how dare you question my behavior? How dare you get in my business? What I do, that's none of your business. Are you saying that kind of stuff to your Nathan? Or are you being like David and humbly accepting the help from your Nathan? How are you treating your Nathan? I just want you to see is while David, while David was certainly a great man of faith and a great man of courage that we hold in high esteem today, he also, he also had some great friends, didn't he? He also had some great and godly friends. He also had some friends, some people in his life who helped mold him and shape him into being the kind of man that the Lord wanted him to be. And it's my hope and my prayer that everybody here in this room has those kind of people as well. It is my hope and my prayer that everybody here has a Nathan and a Jonathan. If you don't have a Nathan and a Jonathan, it's my hope and my prayer that starting the day, one of your goals in life will, will be to get you a Nathan and a Jonathan. It will be to get you some people in your life who won't just do fun things with you and make you laugh, but they'll also help you be better. 
to also help you be better for God and his son, Jesus Christ. We all need Nathans. And we need Jonathans. In fact, beyond needing Nathans and Jonathans in our lives, the number one friend we need is Jesus, right? Above anyone else, the number one person we need in our lives is Jesus. We need Jesus to be our friend above anyone else because no one loves us like Jesus. No one cares for us like Jesus. No one has sacrificed for us like Jesus. And so this morning, if there's someone who needs to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have an opportunity to do that at this time. Whether that means you need to respond to his gospel through faith and repentance and baptism, or if you need to repent and come back into a right relationship with the greatest friend you could ever have in your life. Whatever spiritual needs you may have, you come to the front right now. We'll be glad to help you. Let's stand. Let's sing.